God, we are live. Um, we're so on time today. Hi, Victor. Welcome to Venture with Grace today. Good morning, Grace. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, tax season. So doing taxes over the weekend <laughs> put you in some chaotic mode. But anyway, um, yeah, we just chat about your amazing weekend. And okay, I don't know how much you want the audience to know. But anyway. We're back from spring break. So obviously, you know, now again, way steep into everything that we do every day with games and, and investments. So happy to jump back in straight into a bot podcast with you. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. Let's, I want to like, um, to start the show, I want to the audience to get to know you a little bit more. You know, you went to school in Berkeley. You have worked at some really iconic brands, uh, like NBA, like the, you know, 20th century Fox and Disney and, uh, you know, like Activision, Blizzard. And like, I want to let the audience get to know you a little bit more on like, you know, how you got started in the oh. entertainment space and, you know, like tell us more. Yeah, sure. Well, as a quick snapshot um, of me, let's see, I've spent the last 20 plus years in leading entertainment um, on the interactive side, right? So that includes both games, film and television, on-demand content, et cetera. And, and I've really focused during that time on scaling and growing these businesses. And I've done that for companies, as you mentioned, like Disney, 20th Century Fox, the National Basketball Association, and most recently with um, Activision Blizzard. Um, it, as far as you know, um, the, the the specific areas of the industry that I've always been passionate about, it's, it's always been how technology has enabled consumers to access these types of content in a better way, right? So when I say that, it's it's been things like on-demand film and television, streaming video, and of course now gaming. Um, I'm fascinated by obviously the evolution of technology and how that's again enabled. Um, consumers to get to this content and enjoy it in different ways, faster ways, and in ways that we've never seen before. Um, and as far as, you know, your question with regards to how did I get into entertainment and tech, you know, it, I, I've always um, been some, a, a lover of content and entertainment. I started a music business back in college at, at Berkeley, as you mentioned. And since then, I've, I've just, you know, been wanting to, to figure out how do I continue to you know, leverage the resources around us, especially being in the Bay Area, you know, namely technology, to improve the lives of consumers with regards to accessing content. And so that's when I first joined uh, the Walt Disney Company back in, you know, early 2000s uh, and leading interactive entertainment um, for in business development and interactive entertainment for the Walt Disney and Internet Group. And I've leveraged that experience working globally and looking at how to scale tech and entertainment businesses um, into future endeavors, um, and actually, which took me to Asia for a number of years. Um, Disney had actually sent me out to uh, Greater China in 2005, right out of grad school. I went to grad school at UPenn at Wharton to essentially start a, a uh, interactive entertainment business um, from scratch. And so I actually wrote the strategy and the business case for us to um, focus on games <clears throat> as well as social media, which wasn't even called social media back then, um, as a way of monetizing our content and worked with great partners, um, some of which I'm sure you heard of, like Tencent, right? Mm -hmm. um, back in the day when they were literally just a, a messaging service and have since obviously grown with them into a massive, massive gaming as well as internet portal. Um, and so that's been sort of my trajectory and just kind of following my passion and access to content. How does technology enable better uh, ways to get to content and consume content, and then taking that through through my throughout my career, and and I would say after the MBA, um, I continue to focus on the interactive side of entertainment. And in this case, would um, I joined Twentieth Century Fox when I came back from Asia, based in LA, to run our distribution business, um, still in Asia but based in Los Angeles. And again, that was all about how do we give consumers a way to access our film and television content in a way that's not just linear, right? And so my um, bread and butter was, you know, working on windowing distribution. So, so better windowing of our content to consumers in a faster and better way um, for our Asia Pacific um, uh, consumers. And lastly, of course, at Activision Blizzard, um, I ran the um, global business development and partnerships division for, for us, uh, specifically related to our mobile games. 
And again, this is very much about, you know, how do we work with partnerships? How do we work with other platforms outside of the primary ways of distributing our content through Apple and Google to again, give consumers a better way to more players to consume our, our games. Um, and of course, helping them engage with us in ways that's much more interactive, much more deep um, so that they hopefully spend more time with the games. And then of course, you know, um, spend some money with, with our games as well. Mm. I wonder when you were thinking about like, I guess like I want to start with like, how does partnerships work in these like big companies? Like, you know, like the NBA, like Disney, like um, Activision, like how does some money flow in the industry? And I per to our jump into our like session today, I've um, just like watched a bunch of people talking about like how, you know, music and gaming change how the culture and technology um like us whole but like i wonder in your vision like how does like you know how does the gaming or like i guess like entertainment partnership ecosystem work how does the money flow in general yeah um so the types of partnerships that i've always led and worked on um, have been um very cooperative in the sense that it's how do we work with this partner to grow either distribution or monetization, right? So, um, you know, obviously when people think of business development, there's always the sales side of the function. That mm -hmm. is not what I uh, focused on. Mine was always about sort of mutually beneficial partnerships, literally in, in, in you know, the meaning of the word, to work with these partners to grow the businesses, you know, for, for, both, uh, mm -hmm. for both sides. And so as an example of that, you know, a major partner that I worked with at Activision Blizzard was on the payment side. So if you can imagine, you know, a game as big as Call of Duty Mobile, for example, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of, of monthly active users. You know, we, we knew that around the world, there was a significant amount of players who just don't necessarily have the credit based type payment mechanisms or credit cards right or even bank accounts in order to pay for in-game items right so the mobile games uh, industry as you know is primarily if not exclusively free to play and so this game is, is no different it's a free to play game and we knew that in emerging markets like latin america eastern europe the um these players we had a very very low uh, conversion to paid rate, right? Um, when I say low, lower than compared to obviously the Western uh, markets. And, and part of the, a major reason for that was because people wanted better access to ways to pay that were that they were used to, like cash at retail, e-transfers through banks, mobile payments, right? All of which things, um, are, these kinds of payment me mechanisms, Apple and Google just didn't offer. And so I work with a, a partner called Coda Payments to enable these types of payment mechanisms in a number of countries. We started off in three countries, India, Mexico, and Brazil, and also that we grew that to 25 countries around the world. And they were making a huge difference in our monetization rate, especially in Latin America, upwards of, you know, growth rates of like 40 plus percent uh, in revenue. So for a game like Call of Duty, which as you know, is, is a multi-billion dollar game, that's massive. And so when you talk about the money flow, it, it was very much sharing in the risk and sharing in the success of these partnerships. So the more that our players came and paid for um, in-game items, and of course, then gave them a deeper um, uh, play, right? A, a deeper enjoyment mm -hmm. of our product, mm -hmm. that really allowed um, both of us to succeed, uh, take a risk in a way that was measured, and ultimately rewarded uh, our businesses in a way that was quite significant. And so Coda continues to be you know, a, a close partner of Activision Blizzard, in fact, they just launched a, a direct-to-consumer payment um, service, if you will, for Call of Duty. Now that now includes more than just the mobile game, and so yeah, it's been a fantastic type of partnership that I think really uh, encapsulates everything that you just mentioned. You know, in terms of the, the flow of cash, the flow of value between the partners, um, delivering that kind of additional growth for both businesses, and ultimately leveraging you know each other's strengths and technology in order to to um, you know create success around the game. Um, I wonder, I want to switch gear a little bit, like, so, or like, this is like kind of a full on question. So yeah. I know that, you know, you are like working as an ER as a marker capital. So I'm sure you're like interacting with a lot of startups all day. And I wonder how can startup, um, like do a successful partnership? Like, for example, um, 
like let's say even like this podcast or whatever like even like a media company right like you know we've seen like um you know the diary of ceo like being in like an airplane um like entertainment center that's like a popular podcast in like the i guess like entertainment or like leadership space and then um they're on like every like airplanes like t tiny tv right so if i want to do that kind of partnership like what's a step that you would take is there like you know a certain amount of downloads you have to hit before you go in and then like what is the benefits from for the uh I guess like airplane or like some the the distribution channel to kind of like um they want what do they want to see when they are launching a partnership like this we don't have to use this particular example this is like coming into my mind because like i'm yeah. thinking about like this media business all day right so it could be anything it could be like a soap company trying to get on to you know target or something yeah like um ultimately <laughs> and I know i'm probably stating the obvious here as I advise our portfolio companies on partnerships, it's it's always how do we find that differentiated value, right? To the distribution partner, to the platform partner, to any partner that mm -hmm. they, they can't get. And, and look, that's obviously something that we invest in, right? A differentiated tool, service, platform, technology that we believe um, is, enable, is enabling a new kind of um, path to monetization for whatever business that is. And so I'll give you an example. I'm currently um, heavily spending a lot of time advising a company called Gift Games. In fact, we just uh, launched this past weekend and um, our founder, Phil Scaravage, just posted about it. But anyway, um, it, it's a games rewards program, right? That essentially allows players to play very casual social mobile games, earn rewards and redeem them um, within the valley. So I'm talking to the casino giant, right? Casino resorts giant within their ecosystem. And so, you know, one thing that we have an exclusive offering on is that access to the valley's rewards, right? So you can earn rewards in um, our game platform, go to valleys and not only just exchange it for, you know, um, credits within food and beverage, but also within the, the casino. And, and that's something that we had structured with them in a way that was obviously still legal, um, uh, but, but but gives our players access to something that they can't get anywhere else, right? And so from a value perspective, we're really driving, you know, what we call, you know, obviously IRL in real world, in real life rewards for something that you currently just do um, as an entertainment venue on your phone through games. So that's that's direct value to, to the consumers. And then obviously for Valleys, they don't have a game platform that's currently attracting not only existing Valleys Rewards members, but they really want to leverage this platform to access, you know, um, casual gamers, right? Females and, and younger males alike that currently aren't gaming in their casinos. And so when you drive value in that way, um, again, sort of differentiated, differentiated, you know, access differentiated, um, technology for for both sides it really helps and and you know we're growing we're growing quickly we're still very early stage so mucker invested uh in gift games in the pre-seed stage we're currently raising our our seed stage at this point or actually pre-seed plus probably is more accurate but yeah no, it's, it's really exciting when we see technology like this and um you know sort of exclusive partnerships like this that really give the business you know a, a, a very nice value for the consumer Mm, I wonder, like, how do they start the partnership? Like, how does the negotiation start since, like, you know, the startup team maybe just, like, three people? And let's say the CEO <laughs> go to reach out to, like, this casino or, um, like, a bigger organization, right? So, like, how does a conversation typically start? Like, do you go for the director of partnership at that organization or do you try to shoot for the CEO and, like, they forward your email to their director of partnership or, like, how, I guess, like, how does yeah. it actually work in, like, real life? Yeah, look, it's, um, it, it all, all depends, right, on the partnership itself and the company that we're talking to. But by and large, we, you know, we're, 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 we try to, be very well networked in the space that we're in. In this case, um, it's gaming not only on you know the the, the casual gaming side, but also in, in terms of the casino uh, and resorts type type industries to be very well networked in that space. 
And of course, aim high, right? Aim for the decision makers. And so in this case, where we have a, a very good uh, partner in the chairman of Valley's Casino and Games. And so, you know, working through that kind of a relationship, it helps to first set the vision and strategy for what a partnership like that could look like and help drive that strategy. But but let's be clear, um, when it comes to actually structuring and executing the partnership, it's absolutely crucial that you also have people who are, you know, hands and feet who are working on this, for example, developing the uh, user interface for the app itself to integrate with Valleys, um, to make sure that the details around the rewards program is something that's, you know, um, well structured and done in a way that's attractive to the consumer, things like that. So look, it, it's, it's, we obviously always look for, you know, as, as high of a, of a call it, you know, decision-making power as possible and set the vision and then drive that down. And that's typically, I think, how partnerships start off, you know, in a way that's, that has buy-in, right? Because mm -hmm. if you talk about complicated organizations, whether it's Activision, Blizzard, Disney, Bally's or, or NBA, mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that the vision is, is clear and the strategy mm -hmm. is clear so that the details that come out of that, I don't mean details in a way that's not important whatsoever, but it's, you know, how do we then, you know, um, make the product development, uh, make the go, make the go to market, make the, you know, marketing, right. Um, plans in a way that's, that's got buy-in at, at the very top. So I think that's kind of been our approach. And when I say ours, it's not just Mucker, but, you know, throughout the, my career, it's been working through that kind of a, you know, process. Mm. I want to like go to dig a little bit deeper into like the challenge and like the process within this partnership, right? Like, yeah. um, I want to like pull like a crypto era example. Let's say like, you know, Dapper Lab back in time was like famously yeah. partnered with like, you know, NBA or something like, um, so like the sports brands mm -hmm. and I think they, that kind of like, elevated their brand like immediately and however before that i've never heard of dapper lab or crypto kitty or something so i wonder like for that kind of partnership to happen beside the ceo maybe like you know half an investor in the um a partnership like mba like how let's say after i had the first call with their team what should I do to like follow up? And then how often should I follow up? And why would the NBA want to partner with like Dapper Lab? Like how would you right. kind of like see, you know, they could pick anyone because if they want to going into gaming or blockchain, there's like 4 billion companies. And like, I wonder, besides like the indicators would be like, you know, it's backed by a famous VC founder or something like how else could they be able to identify this as like a valuable partnership for them? Yeah, well, it goes back to probably to the, your last question first, which is how do they, why did they deliver the value in a way that the NBA was interested? Um, I didn't work on that deal. I was still, I left. Yeah, I had just left the NBA to come back to um, Los Angeles with 20th Century Fox. So I don't know the specifics mm -hmm. of that deal, but just observing it and knowing that partnership from them. Um, you know, consumer perspective, I can speak a little bit um, about it. So look, um, I think Dapper Labs were able to identify a sports league that was very much looking to leverage technology, again, to access consumers and to touch their consumers in a, in a different way. Um, and the NBA has always been very progressive in doing that, especially right around that time was when Adam Silver, the new commissioner, um, who, I, who I absolutely adore and, and just is a fantastic, fantastic executive. He, um, you know, changed some of the older ways of doing business and partnerships at the NBA to look at more technology forward type businesses. And this was one of them, right? We were looking at, or they were looking at, you know, collectibles in a way that not only attracted the traditional baseball card, basketball card, you know, um, memorabilia collectors, but the, the new digital savvy, um, uh, you know, internet users and, and, and people that, you know, perhaps hadn't thought of the NBA as being technology forward. And so Dapper approached NBA at the right time, right? And in a way that really delivered value to exactly what, what the NBA wanted, which is how do you give value to, to, you know, NBA fans around the world, or at least in that case uh, in the United States that didn't have before. And so these NFTs, right, for, 
famous moments in basketball, you know, really, I think, resonated with not only the, um, the league, but also with, at least initially, with the NBA fans, right? Um, and I actually really was very bullish about that partnership um, because I, I always thought of it as a perfect example of why a, you know, on-chain, limited edition digital asset made sense because, you know, LeBron's first game, you know, with the Cleveland Cavaliers or Michael Jordan's infamous dunk, right? It's, it doesn't happen again, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not something you can create again. And that's exactly why an NFT has value, right? You're, you're memorializing and putting on chain with full transparency and full accountability, accountability um, for something that only exists once. And so sports highlights, uh, you know, again, credit to the Dapper guys, you know, they really saw that as a way to reflect the NFT um, uh, value. And so, so that's, I think, the reason why that, that, that partnership delivered that value. Um, as far as how often did they follow up, I, I don't know. Um, or even just the best practices, I, I, you know, it's something that's, again, probably, I'm sure, case by case and partner by partner. But, it, it, you know, I think when you go back to what, how do you de deliver that differentiated value and then talk to the right decision makers, you know, at, at the higher level, um, I think that's how you start to formulate those really strategic and visionary type relationships that, um, that can deliver, you know, a lot of value for, for both sides. Mm. I wonder when you are thinking about like the different companies that you have worked at, like from the MBA to 24, um, um, 20, like, um, I can never wow. pronounce it. Right. Right. So, like, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. at 24, uh, 20, 20th Century Fox uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, Activision. So I wonder, or like Disney. So I wonder, like, what's the similarities and differences in working at these different entertainment-related companies uh, in terms of partnerships? Yeah. Um, gosh, it's, 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 a, it's a very, very broad question. And um, I think how I'll sort of address that is, look, um, all these companies, the similarities, right? Um, mm -hmm. All these companies are going to look for top-notch, you know, world-class partners, whether they're startups to, you know, the biggest internet companies in the world, right? Uh, or technology providers in the world. And so I think that's a given, right? And we expect that our partners are going to do business in a, in a very much top-notch, world-class way and deliver value back to us. Um, similar in that very you know top-notch world-class way, and and that's it, it, again it almost sounds obvious, but look, there's there's companies out there that may not have the same vision of delivering value, and they're just looking for a short-term gain and leveraging our brand, for example, mm -hmm. right? And I think having had the good fortune of working with these companies, yeah, you see you see not that they're bad actors or bad entrepreneurs or bad you know uh, companies at all. I just there are certain companies that are look like to your point about leveraging the NBA's brand to really launch Dapper Labs um, into, you know, the, the common person's lexicon, right? Um, there are many companies who want to do that. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the company themselves that we partner with are absolutely of top notch management strategy and, uh, and vision. And then, but also as we execute that, that the project itself we see the execution in a way that's that's the same. So that's that's first and foremost the similarities. Um, the difference is, I would say again, we're probably going to get into you know, without getting into the specific details of the partnership or deals, it's hard to really address that. Um, but look, you know, I, I think Disney um, are all, is always going to look for technology and partners that's going to help them access more consumers um, in different ways and in different ways, right? Um, whether it's on, on device, on mobile devices now, or on demand, you know, from a time perspective, that's always going to be Disney. Um, and if you think about partners for, you know, Activision Blizzard, again, it, it all goes back to how do we get further distribution? How do we get better ways to monetize our games, right? And of course, from a brand perspective, what are the brands that we can work with to get the eyeballs, to help us get the eyeballs of, you know, players that currently don't potentially engage with our games at this point. So it just really depends on case by case, but, but the overriding similarity though, goes back to that, 
top-notch company that these companies would strive to work with. Um, I wonder, um, I want to like maybe have, like this is a maybe complex question. When is like, you know, how do you start the entertainment business from scratch and back in China? And mm -hmm. like a kind of like question in the similar zone is like, as a startup founder, you want to grow your distribution. You want to grow, like you want to monetize. And what should they think about it first? Should money come first so you can buy future distribution or distribution sure. come first? Like to, so you can like um, having more people pay for your things. Like how do you, what's the thinking framework um, of a founder when it comes to building strategic partnerships and would it be like a numbers game like let's partner with like 10 big company or like let's like email everybody from like all these tier one company or you should like really tailor it down to like you know the three company in a particular space yeah. um yeah. yeah it's a good question um well let's talk about that right so um the disney case in, in china so um coming out of grad school i had worked at disney prior to going back mm -hmm. to business school um, and where I was leading international business development, as I mentioned. And so I've done a lot of international partnership work with Disney prior to, to grad school and coming out of grad school, they, you know, obviously I was interested in coming back to Disney and they basically said, look, you're Chinese, you speak Chinese. Um, don't come back to Burbank. We, you know, you have, you could do much more for us out in China. And what we really wanted was to, for you to figure out how do we monetize Disney content in that region? So obviously Disney had a very robust brand uh, in China and Asia, but outside of traditional consumer products and a little bit of television business, there really wasn't much other avenues that we were, this is 2005, right? So just to give you some mm -hmm. context. Um, so, so, you know, almost 20 years ago. And um, my job was to go out there in a business development um, role to figure out the strategy to monetize our content. So digitally, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's exactly what I did. I landed literally with a piece of paper and luggage. I had no kids, not but wasn't married back then, and just pounded the pavement and just talked to every technology, internet, platform, social media company that I could. So I'm talking about companies, as I mentioned, Tencent, Chanda, The Nine, um, and on and on and on, and just you know figured out what is the way, right, to to the best way, right, the most efficient and, and profitable way to monetize our content digitally. And I ultimately wrote a business case and strategy around focusing on games. And I think I mentioned earlier and social media. And again, it wasn't even called social media back then. It was just how do we give internet users in China um, our content in a way that allows them to interact with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that they found fun and, and engaging. And so uh, I then took that strategy, got buy-in from the Burbank folks because you know everything that's done at Disney needs to be approved to headquarters. Um, and once we got the buy-in, you know, going out and talking to those partners that I just mentioned, and it wasn't a numbers game. It was absolutely about quality over quantity, right? It was, you know, we had the objective of, you know, who, who, who can help us produce the best product, right? In games and social media, who had a brand that resonated with consumers in China, who had the best technology, right? To kind of enable those first two things as well. And so we settled in on a few partners. One of them was, was Tencent. Um, the other was Shanda, which still exists, but is a much smaller game company now. Shanda, right? Um, and mm -hmm. the last one was NetDragon, a smaller um, gaming company based in Fuzhou, that, uh, which is very, very, very good partner to work with in terms of developing new products and games for us. And so through those relationships, we actually developed um, Disney's first ever locally produced, locally developed MMORPG with NetDragon. Um, we released a social media platform with Tencent, you know, when they were primarily focused on social media that ultimately turned into uh, my relationship with them at the NBA and, and into games and beyond. And so, you know, it's, it's that kind of kind of methodical procedural kind of steps that I took in order to build a strategy, identify the partners, talk to those partners and negotiate the deals that made sense for uh, for both Disney and, and, and the partners in China. Um, how do you 
articulate the vision to let's say the people at Disney like I know that like you know we talk about like being efficient and profitable um I guess like do you do a financial modeling first on like you know how much this game would be able to generate for Disney and like why this golden market is better than XYZ or like how do you demonstrate this is like the way to do do it to like the people on the management team and what are things that you would tell like these like smaller vendors or like eventually a Tencent to you know buying into the process as well yeah uh, go ahead no, I, I assume like convincing smaller company to, you know, work with Disney is not that hard, but um, we'll, we'll, I want to be mindful of like, it was 2005, like maybe Disney wasn't like as, you know, popular as it is today as like the global impact started from these kind of partnerships. Right, right. Um, look, I mean, so we talk about the, the Disney side. Um, look, it was a, a, a very much a business case building type of an exercise, right? We went in and said, what are the four or five different opportunities that we have here in China and greater China that could be, that could monetize our uh, digital content? Um, we looked at things like education, um, edutainment, perhaps is probably a better word. Mm -hmm. We looked at things like, um, uh, uh, gosh, what else was there? Like things that accompanied the building of Hong Kong Disneyland, for example. Mm -hmm right back then that that you know content that leveraged that in real life product mm -hmm. so on and so forth and ultimately you're right we, we i had um a, a team a small team that built the financial model as well as opportunity assessment around all these opportunities and really felt like how do we achieve the objectives of reaching mass user base right that that found disney content to be appealing how do you then convert those users into a paid cohort, right? In a way that we were, that our partners could potentially be very good at, right? And three, it helped us build the brand. You know, we wanted companies mm -hmm. and partners and businesses that helped build um, Disney brand in a way that was very positive uh, and continued to lay the foundation for future Disney businesses. I mentioned Hong Kong Disneyland, um, which opened while I was out there. And then of course, Shanghai Disneyland was being built, or actually at that point, only in strategy phase, right? But then later being built and operated. Um, so we wanted, you know, people use the word synergy at, at Disney all the time, mm -hmm. and it's a little bit old, but it's true. Like everything that we did, we delivered value, not only for the division of that business, but the synergistic value to our other division was something we thought about um, as well. And, and, and that's that's where, you know, uh, as you look at the TAM and, and you know, um, the potential for growth, and profitability, um, we saw that as the highest with gaming and social media. And so that that was an exercise. I don't think it was, you know, all that different than anybody who's building a new opportunity, a new business case for projects or initiatives at, at, at small and big companies. It was, it was fairly straightforward. I mean, it was a lot of work, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but and it, took, it took a bit of time, but that process was similar. And talking with partners, you know, even in 2005, I mean, Disney's been around for 100 plus years now, and it's we still had a very strong brand, you know, in 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 the region, and so it wasn't difficult to your point to convince partners like Tencent to work with us. The question was really more around what's the right product, right? And how do what we negotiated over, as you can imagine, is the economic relationship between the licensor, which is Disney. And the licensee because this wasn't a typical you know selling disney collectibles you know or hats or clothes this was an interactive product on games and social media that as i mentioned just has not been done before you know, around the world and so you know i took a lot of pride in structuring the, these deals that ultimately allowed us to produce like as i mentioned the first locally developed mmo um, anywhere in the world and so you had to look at um, not only the basic um, transactional items such as the license of the content, but also what about the inbound revenues? How do we account for that, both not only in terms of the, the, um, the in-app purchases uh, or the in-game purchases, but there's advertising, there's mm -hmm. referral business coming from Tencent's other very, very, you know, at that point, still pretty big, you know, platforms, et cetera. And so 
you have to make sure that all those things are taken into account. And a lot of it, we just had to um, hypothesize, right? Because it hasn't been done before. And and uh, and again, you know, I, I think we we take a lot of pride in knowing our products and knowing our brands well enough to say, look, this is the we believe this is the value that we deliver to Tencent, NetDragon, and Shanda's um, consumers. You know, let's start, let's create a product based around that and, and let's make sure that the value captured on both sides is fair. Mm. I feel like what differentiate like a good startup versus like like a, like a, a bad startup is like kind of like their partnership strategy or mm. kind of like how they grow, right? Like essentially I feel like on, at a startup you want to achieve global scale. You have to partner with bigger brands. Um, I wonder what is like the core quality of like a successful BD person. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like it's sales strategy? Do you feel like it's like reaching out email? Do you feel like it's a um, incentive alignment? Like how would you think about or like the core skill the CEO should be mastering when they are like partnering with bigger brands? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's again a really good question. Um, if, if we first um, isolate when we say business development as strategic partnerships, right? Because I think, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, a lot of people, or not, you know, some people think of business development as sales. And if we take that component away, um, you know, like pure sales, obviously there's a sales component to business development for sure, but like Mm -hmm. selling, you know, Cisco servers or, you know, um, Samsung mobile phones, that's not, the kind of business development that I'm talking about. I'm talking about thinking strategically and holistically on how do we work with partners to grow. If we if we look at that, right? So, so what are, what are some qualities of folks, or how do they should think about the role? Um, I think there's, there's a few things come to mind. One is, as, as I mentioned, you know, a strategic thinking around what, how do we, what do we need as a business, as a product, as a platform, as a tool, right? To as a technology to grow, right? Um, and, and, and that's where the differentiation with sales comes in, right? Um, sales is typically six months to a year, maybe two years focused. I'm talking about three to five years out, right? And five years plus out, how do we grow this business? Is it distribution? Is it, is it um, access to different monetization tools? Is it, um, access to creative, you know, all of those things, right? Mm-hmm. How do you like? What is a strategy and vision for doing that? That's the first and foremost thing that I think good BD people should have. Um, the second is, you know, obviously a network of mm-hmm. folks in the relevant industries, and so you know, you'll see you know, all of us, a lot of folks like us in industry events and conferences like GDC, like you know, uh, CES and different crypto conferences around around the country, even around the world, because you know, and do it in a way that's Called productive, right? I think a lot of times people go out and just network, network for the sake of networking, but be very focused and productive in who you're talking to and the companies that you're approaching. Um, the third is, of course, negotiations. I think, you know, um, it's it's really a skill that takes certainly, you know, a mind that that thinks uh, a lot about how do you get the best deal, but 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 mo- but a, but when I say the the best deal, it's not like let's go out there and get as much money or as much revenue share or as much minimum guarantee from a partner as possible. That's only one way to think about it, but it's how you deliver that value back to them, right? In a way that's productive mm-hmm. and fair. And I think that's that takes a lot deeper thinking around the again the, the value exchange between the parties than just how do we you know, get the most money. Right. Because especially nowadays in the digital world and you know, the web three worlds in the web two and a half world, there's so much value being created. That's not just dollars and cents, right? It's access, it's distribution, it's um, new technology that's positioning your brand in a different way, like NFTs, right? All those things are new and different and growing. And so how do you leverage that in order to create value for yourselves, but then deliver value back to the partner as well? Um, and lastly, it's just, you know, I think it's related to the negotiation you know, just experience. And, and this is something that, you know, if you take years and years of doing partnerships and deals, you've seen a lot, um, not just in terms of deal structures, obviously that's extremely helpful um, and different components of deal structures that can be leveraged in order to create a good partnership, 
thinking of new creative ways to do things, um, you know, in, in a deal, but also just you've seen where things have gone bad <laughs> and deal structures that just were not set up in a way, you know, call it, you, you, could, you could have seen that problem coming from a mile away sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, that kind of experience for whether it's, again, whether it's a startup or a more mature business, I think really bakes into, you know, a robust, good business development team. Um, totally. I wonder, I wrote down some questions while you're talking. One is like, I wonder, um, you know, like when you're walking into the conversation, how do you prepare yourself? And then what are the questions you would ask the, um, business leader at a big company to like understand their goals? Because I mean, you could read so much in the news, but super hard to understand what does it look like internally when you're right. working with them right yeah yeah look um I, I believe in just transparency for sure when i'm working with a partner and so be prepared right so do all the research that, that you need to to understand what is the current business strategy for this company all the way at the very top Right. Meaning what is their vision? What is their strategy for growth in the next, you know, whatever year to three years and then drive that down to your particular project. And a lot of this information, if it's a public company, great. You can see a lot of that in their earnings reports and um, public releases. And uh, if it's a smaller company, look, a lot of that information, get that from industry people Googling, <laughs> it turns up a ton of information. Mm -hmm. So, Get, get that prepared and then have a hypothesis around, you know, we believe that XYZ company is looking to grow in the Western European market through, you know, direct to consumer platform, whatever it is. We've read about this and this is how you're, you guys are planning to do it. Can you please validate? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and to ask them. It's there's there's no need to be mysterious or try to pretend like you're smarter than them if you're not they, nobody's going to know your partner's company better than that than they do um and and just validate it and once you validate that it's the very beginning of developing that vision strategy together mm. or, or um, not i mean they could tell you sorry you know all everything that's been written about us is complete um you know wrong completely wrong and so here's what we how we actually feel about it and then they answered your question. So I think that's just be completely upfront and transparent and, and just get that answer. Mm. I wonder when you are um, walking into, like you mentioned about like, you know, understanding by like, you know, Googling them and like, how do you walk through the conversation? And like, do you just ask them like, you know, let's say if you are um, Activision and then I come in as a startup founder who is doing something, let's say like I'm doing like a music licensing startup or something, and then I want to partner with you guys. Um, so if you took the meeting, I'm sure there's some sort of synergy. So like, I wonder, like, I guess like the number one is like, how do you get to the meeting? Uh, besides like, you know, warm introduction. As a startup founder, you may not have the warm introduction. Like how do you kind of approach the CEO to make it sound somewhat aligned with whatever they're doing? And also the CEO is like very, or like not CEO, but like, you know, um, anyone in the high level executive, the executive team have like a million things on their plate. Mm -hmm. um, how do you fight for their attention? And like, you know, do you go out, do, do you go in there to, ask them what they want first or like what if they ask you what you want to sell first like you know how do you kind of navigate the conversation from like you know the, yeah well look it, it, you know as, as i mentioned it's it's it goes all it goes back to how you deliver that differentiated value right mm -hmm. um I, you know obviously as, as when i was head of global business development for our mobile games it was something that we got a lot of inbound interest on working with us for all the obvious reasons, right? There's, we have to create world-class games um, in a world-class way. Um, but I would say the first and foremost, you got to figure out what that value is you're, you, that you're delivering to Activision, Blizzard, or King, right? So those are three different business divisions. At, or again, whether it's Disney or NBA, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, going to the top, the CEO, COO, whoever, you know, SVP, VP, whoever it is that to get the introduction is great, but ultimately 
when it comes down to, especially in games, right? If it's not creating um, a better gameplay or a differentiated you know, a way to to you know to create narratives um, in in the, in the game building process or new tools that helps me develop characters and, and graphics you know faster and better, it's not going to go very far, right? It's got to deliver value, and mm-hmm. so like there's often often many times we'll we'll get emails from other executives that that um, in the C-suite or what have you say, can you please take a look at this? Uh, an investor, a friend, whoever, you know, is creating this new, new new game development tool, whatever. And we'll look at it, but ultimately if the game team feels like it's not helping, then it's not going to get very far. And so it, it's, it's, you know, as, as a startup or as a CEO and as an entrepreneur, you know, hopefully you're building something that is differentiated mm-hmm. and that value added, right, mm-hmm. to the potential company. And again, it doesn't need to be Activision, doesn't need to be EA, doesn't need to be Riot. It's just, even with another game company, you know, startups competing with startups is absolutely something that happens, but you mm-hmm. got to deliver that value. And mm-hmm. knowing the, the vision of your partner's business and the strategy and how they want to execute and grow has to be the first step that you take. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's say if I'm a Silicon Valley startup working on, let's say, like uh, um, AI models, it's like, you know, we're living in 2024, everything is AI anyway. So I'm doing like a um, AI graphic model that's like, a, um, you know, similar to Sora, but like different, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I want to come in and then partner with an amazing game company like, you know, Activision. Um, or Disney, like, you know, how should that process go? Like, so should I talk to, uh, let's say, like, I got introduction to, um, you know, per to basically your previous position and, like, how would you interact with the founder? And, like, so do you send the product to your game development um, VP of engineering first and then let them take a look and then you decide to take the meeting or not? Or... Would you chat with the funder first, understand like if there's any other way to potentially collab and like how how should like they kind of like enter the game of enter the conversation in general? And yeah. well, since like you're very experienced, who are the people actually when? Besides, like, you know, you mentioned about differentiation or differentiated value. Can you unpack that a little bit on like, you know, what is like a good case study of differentiated value? Yeah, yeah. Um, so game companies are obviously, you know, game driven. I, I, that's that's true, true, obviously stating something that everybody knows. But when it comes to so, I can say use the word so when it comes to partnerships, especially on the game side, right? If you're wanting to deliver value specifically for a game, whether it's Diablo Immortal or or Call of Duty Mobile. Um, the product is king and so you got to make sure um that who you're talking to and the differentiated value that you're delivering really meets the goals of the game team's you know future vision right so at activision um you know i sat at the enterprise layer so i had um the honor of and the privilege of servicing and supporting all three of the business division. So again, Activision, Blizzard, and King. And as I worked with them, um, I was really a, a connector um, and a collaborator, if you will, to the executive producers of whatever game that we're working on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that person, he or she, is ultimately the person that needs to be convinced of the value of this partnership, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that that holds true for pretty much all the game companies that I've ever worked with um, and game divisions that I've, you know, um, you know, collaborated with. And so, so that, that's, that's the process to work through Um, again, particularly from a game development collaboration, right? Um, Mm -hmm. There's going to be another side of of business development and partnerships that's more brand related. So you're thinking about Mm -hmm. Call of Duty, Call of Duty working with a Mountain Dew, uh, a Red Bull, mm-hmm. um, uh, Hummer, for example, right? That's also driven. That's driven by another team called brand sponsorships. 
Um, and, and so in a very same vein, ultimately, it all goes back to the executive producer of these games that, that make the decision whether this is, this is something that they see value in. Um, mm -hmm. Both in terms of the brand collaboration, but also the the money and <clears throat> and, the, and the marketing access that these companies are providing for the game, and so so just make sure that you're you're delivering value for the executive producer because at least at Activision that was absolutely the the, the team or the people that you needed to convince. Um, and and once I was able to get that you know sort of green light or, or convince them that this is the right partnership, then I would move forward and structure the deals and and um and the various deal terms right in a way that continue to meet the objective of the executive producers and so so yes that's the process um i would take and then we don't want to talk about the differentiated value i mean again it depends on the particular deal partnership that you're talking about you know if we without rehashing too much of what we mentioned earlier in terms of the the coda payments partnership it was exactly that right they um brought to us the ability to access payment mechanisms in emerging markets that we didn't have and that the, the traditional established app stores didn't have, right? Again, you know, um, I'm talking about cash at retail and, and e-bank transfers and things like that. So that was true, true value. But they also delivered things like just go to market uh, execution in these, mar in, in these um, emerging markets where we, even though we had teams doing marketing in those Mm -hmm. In those countries, I'm talking about again, you know, Brazil, Mexico, India, mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, right? Um, we could, we could, we could certainly use a jumpstart with mm -hmm. um, the teams that our partner had on the ground already doing marketing because they had a direct to consumer platform that was called Coda, Coda Store, I believe it was, mm -hmm. CodaStore.com in, you know, 200 plus, plus uh, languages that consumers could access and top up their call of duty um, points, for example. So, so that's, those are the things that we knew as a partnership, it was a great, great fit because they delivered the value, access, payment mechanisms, consumers and go to marketing um, mm -hmm. that we can do. Um, and at the same time, we did a little game in, in the brand that allowed them to obviously make a very good offering on their store. So. Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of differentiated value that I that I really see as good, you know, bringing about good partnerships. Okay, so I wonder. I have a couple questions there. One yeah. is, let's say you mentioned about like brand partnership, like you know Mountain Dew, Call of Duty, that kind of things. Um, so I feel like that's more for like advertising dollars, band kind of thing. So like I wonder, uh, and then there's like you know the quota payment um situation which is like an actually realistically functional monetized partnership so one yeah. is for distribu distribution slash partnership uh or marketing one is for like distribution and monetization and i wonder like how do you showcase a budget to like let's say the ceo like how like you know like how do you reflect let's say you know the mountain dew partnership like how do you even evaluate if it's like a successful i'm sure it would generate some press but like how does that result in into sales or like brand loyalty how do you kind of ev evaluate brand loyalty through these kind of like partnerships yeah um so i was not on the brand partnership side of the business um mm -hmm. so can't speak too many details about about you know specifically around mountain dew or mm -hmm. other but you know, for us, I think a couple of levels, right? I always start at the strategic level, right? Does that brand deliver the kind of brand synergy that we would look for? And so, so for example, a Call of Duty Mobile, it was very much, you know, a, a mid-core um, app action first-person shooter that we saw as being, you know, thrilling and exciting, right? And so the brands like a Mountain Dew or a Red Bull match perfectly with our brand. So from delivering that brand synergy is certainly one. Mm -hmm. um, we would obviously work with agencies and internal numbers as well as our partners to measure things that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. reach, engagement, um, brand recall, uh, brand interaction, conversion to paid, right? Those kinds of metrics are obviously things that we would measure after the fact to measure the value of those partnerships. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning of, of that, there's, there's certainly the, um, uh, uh, an economic exchange, right? In terms of, you know, a license fee or a minimum guarantee that, that did deliver the value in, in monetary terms uh, immediately, 
to, mm -hmm. to us. And so, look, um, that's how we would think about it. And um, so it's both a brand as well as an economic um, incentive, kind of a, a deal structure for, for Activision Blizzard. Um, how do you learn about partnerships in general? Like, did you have a mentor early on that kind of like being on your personal board of advisors to like guide you through the journey of like having a successful career in this department? Yeah, it's, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, there was a, a single mentor. There's probably a group of mentors that I've been lucky to have throughout my career um, that I continue to lean on. And there are from early parts of my, my career, for example, at Disney and the NBA that I continue to, you know, mm -hmm. um, be, be very in touch with and talk to on a regular basis. But getting into business development and partnerships, it was probably more aligned around my passion um, of growth, driving growth for businesses mm -hmm. than anything else. And um, I tend to think of myself as, as somebody who loves to work with others and partner with people to create that, that growth and success. And so this kind of naturally became uh, a role and a, a function that fit well with my personality, expertise, and, and interests. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I continued to work. I mean, those, those mentors were not business development focused necessarily. And so I can't say that, that was, you know, the singular reason, but it was really around what I love to do. I mean, when I create partnerships that are driving, you know, millions, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of value for both my company as well as a partner, and you're doing it in a way that's innovative and technology forward, that's exciting to me. I like to do deals. I like to negotiate. Um, in a way, in finding that strategic path forward that creates uh, a lot of fun and value for both sides, I, I, I thrive on that, and mm -hmm. and so that's that's why how I got started in this. You know, I certainly didn't go to business school, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. with a major in business development. There's no such thing. Um, but as I came out, right, like as I mentioned, the first job I had out of business school was at Disney, trying to figure out how do we create a business, right, in China. Um, and, and so that kind of led me down the path of us. So to say, hey, you know, creating new businesses, writing a strategy, forming the partnerships to grow is something that I'm really passionate about. And so I've continued to pursue that throughout my career. Um, I want to I want to be mindful of time. I have one yeah. real question. Uh, I'll run like real one real question and then one one minute fire on for you. Um, like one last real question is like, um, how do you attract people before you pitch? Because I think it's a lot easier when if I heard of a company, let's say using the, um, you know, AI company example, um, let's say if it's like a AI company coming out of Silicon Valley, they want to go to Hollywood. They want to go to, um, you know, all these like big game studio. Yeah. They want to sell to Disney. They want to sell to NBA. Like what should they do to get on the partnership people's radar um, before they go in and pitch? Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's starting off small, right? prove your product and your platform on, you know, other, other, with other companies that may not be as a big of a brand, right? Because if you think about those companies that I've worked with and the companies that you mentioned, there's a lot at stake, right? Um, and, and you, you can't think of, okay, this is one technology solution, whether it's AI or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if Disney delivers a so-so product to, to the consumer, it resonates very poorly across, you know, the brand. And we, we never want to do that. And the same with every other company that I've worked with. And so I think for startups, whether it's AI or crypto or, you know, game dev tools, like start small, like start with a small to medium sized company who are looking for this technology, this new solution, um, and build those business cases, build those success stories. Right. I think everybody's dream, perhaps, I shouldn't say dream, but, you know, the, the, the leapfrog is to work with a Disney right away like Dapper did. But I'm pretty sure Dapper had, I'm almost certain they had other business cases before that. Um, I'm not that familiar with, with those, but but I, I, I'm certain that they had some success cases before that, before, you know, NBA agreed to work with them. So start there and build those business cases. Because that's certainly something I asked for as companies come inbound for, for relationships, you know, so how does it, how did this deliver value for XYZ game company or might've been a small to independent. So, so that's where I would start. 
Mm. Okay, I think that's a great advice. I have a one minute fire round for you. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite book? Oh gosh, um, it was actually called Pivot. Um, my favorite book is I've been reading it recently because it's it's it talks about how do you continue to pivot in your career in different mm -hmm. ways that that allows you to continue learning. Um, because you know, I, you know, the theme throughout my career has always been uh, digital entertainment, interactive, um, and so that's that's clearly been, been been the theme. And I'm now adding on a pretty, it's I wouldn't say different, but a um, a functional layer of venture capital, right? Mm -hmm. To to that industry expertise, and so as I'm doing that, there's so much synergy between some of the work that I've done because I've, I've worked with, you know, starting new businesses uh, at Disney and others, um, and, and really kind of startup initiatives at, at places like Activision and in the, in the NBA. And so how do I leverage that experience to pivot into more of a venture capital mind frame, which is, you know, why I'm working with Mucker Capital now and thinking through investments in tech and entertainment. And so, yeah, that's a great book and, you know, would recommend it for everybody who's thinking about their careers in sort of different paths. Mm, who would you invite to your dinner party? My dinner party. Hmm. That's a good one. Um, besides like my family, of course. <laughs> it's your party. It's my party. Um, gosh, I, you know, I, I would love to have Albert Einstein come to my dinner party. Amazing. Because um, I read a lot about his work, and my son, who's now nine years old, is an absolute science um, science fiend. He, he loves, he's only nine, but he reads and, and devours that stuff. And Einstein's one of his um, idols, and so I would love for my son to meet with him, and I would learn a ton, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, who, who made the biggest impact in your career? Um, I, I have to say my wife. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've done some some pretty cool things with companies, but like, it's not been all, you know, green pastures and flowers, right? There's absolutely been times where, you know, whether it's career or project or bosses, right, that were tough, and she's the, been the one to to really keep me, you know, focused and, uh, you know, kind of be grateful for the the friends, you know, colleagues and and uh, the the career that I do have, and so. So yeah, I would say she's the one who's who's um, kept me kept me very much grounded and focused on on uh, what's important in my life. Amazing! You should send her this podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, where can we find you outside of work? Gosh, I'm a big um, uh, kind of sports person. I, I I play basketball twice a week. I swim three times a week. And uh, that's probably where you'll find me is either on basketball court or at the pool. Um, outside of my life, look, I got two young kids, um, nine year old son Tyler and a seven year old daughter Celine. And so you probably find me at their school or taking them to their activities. Honestly, with young kids, you are literally a chauffeur. You're a career chauffeur <laughs> outside of your career job. And uh, that's what I would be doing. So whether it's Tyler's baseball game or Celine's, she's, she's a swimmer as well. We're at her swim practice. That's where I would uh, be with my me. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's work and family at this point, and that's about it. Amazing. Well, um, Victor, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, thanks a lot. It was a, it was a great, uh, great time chatting with you, and we'll talk again. Awesome.